This will be a six part build series of the machine, so we'll go through everything from design all the way down to final assembly. Uh, we'll review some of the components that we installed onto the machine. Some of it was new to us, some of it wasn't. Uh, we'll go over how those all worked. We'll do a little bit of testing on the machine. Uh, we'll run it through a gambit of materials that I want it to be able to mill, see how well it works. Then we'll do a lessons learned, so that will be a one year review. We have since had the machine for a year, we have about 2,000 hours on it, so we can review where it's at now, any problems we may or may not have had with it, what kind of design elements we'll incorporate into future machines, and sort of where we'll go from there. So, comments or questions, please reach out. If there's any omissions in my explanations, I would happily clarify them. I am very passionate about building these machines. I'm quite fortunate that we get to use them every single day in our manufacturing operations. There's always opportunities to build new machines and we love trying different things out. Every machine is a little bit different and all lessons learned just get applied to the next one we build. So the basics of this machine are, it is a two foot by two foot by eight inch uh, working platform. It is a traveling gantry machine. And in this configuration, it is all ball screw driven. Uh, the work surfaces are interchangeable. We have it pictured here with a peg surface, but that surface is bolted through a fixed hole pattern to the surface. Interchangeable tops include the peg surface, a vacuum surface, a regular spoil board, and vices and that is to be expanded sort of depending on purpose the upper tub design is slightly recessed that's designed to contain a bit of the debris and give us some options for containment there is also a recycling system for coolant when we're doing metal cutting around the machine uh, there are four ball screws so there's two that drive the gantry they're underneath here and then one for each of the other two they are all 20 millimeter pitch ball screws, save for the Z-axis, that is a 16 millimeter pitch ball screw. We we're trying to achieve a decent speed with this machine just to make it productive. Um, the entire machine is a series of plate cuts that are assembled into this basic hull. So we'll explore that process a little bit further. There are a series of covers and protective equipment on the machine. There's some features not pictured here for dust collection and some other, other things that we're going to try and adapt to this machine just to make it a little more user friendly. Additionally, there is a design component of the machine we are building. It is primarily a test bed. So we were testing two drive systems on the machine. There are the ball screw drives and provisions for uh, two different rack and pinion setups. So the machine we're building looks slightly different than this one. This has been, uh, this model has been updated slightly just with some of the things we discussed that we'd incorporate into the next one. So this one looks a little different. Machine we're building does have some backup options and test options built into it. So you'll see some of those. But in essence, it is the exact same machine. So this is this is it. This is what it looks like. This is what we're going to be building. Hopefully it'll turn out like this. But in the preliminary modeling, it all looks pretty good and I'm and quite happy with the design. So from that file that I showed you, here are the CAD files translated into metal cuts. So this is all quarter inch, uh, just mild steel, A36 plate. You can see this is basically how it comes off the machine. Most of it's pretty good. There might be slight warpage in the plate. The sheet products aren't perfect. So the whole idea of this machine was to eliminate as much of the post-processing to the welded assembly as possible. And the post-processing that I'm referring to are sort of the three main panes which are hole drilling for assemblies, surface machining, and alignment correction. What I wanted was a chassis that I could more or less bolt parts to after the welding was complete. So to facilitate this, I've incorporated all the required holes and joints for the plates into the cuts. So let's talk a little bit about the cuts. The plates I'm using are mostly quarter inch 836 mild steel that have been uh, produced on a industrial Mitsubishi laser system. These cuts, as far as locational accuracy, 
linearity and squareness are going to be as accurate as can be achieved in a non-contact cutting operation. So this means as long as the cut files are accurate, all of our plate fitments, hole locations, and tolerances should leave little room for error on the fabrication end. We'll use the joint cuts, which are straight and square, to pull the plates and assemblies into alignment. As we all know, steel products are not straight or flat to begin with, and the heat from cutting and welding just exacerbates this issue, making steel very hard to work with uh, when high precision is required without uh, surface grinding or milling of completed assemblies. The process will not eliminate the possibility of fabrication errors, so careful jigging, welding uh, in conjunction with a, a flat work surface, and some decent measurement tools, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, should get us pretty darn close. Uh, I've seen a lot of fabrication tables built in this method to produce a fixturing table, welding table, uh, without the $6,000 price tag. Uh, in the cutting files, I ran some test pieces and determined that I could reduce the size of the cuts, specifically on the tabs and joints, to correct for the laser location as far as where the laser is actually cutting, whether it's on the line or offset, as well as correct for the kerf that is produced by the cutting. And with this, I was able to get a very tight fitment on all my joints, which should help with uh, jigging accuracy considerably. I've adopted these methods into almost all of my projects uh, as there's just no contest as far as time savings and build quality but this is my first crack at building a CNC this way. So we'll see how it goes. Just gonna use a couple of these just to lift the surface off my work table here, just so that the tabs can protrude through the backside. So there's the z-axis plate, the y-axis plate, they just nest like so. So this will be mounted obviously to the bearings, the rails will be mounted to the other plate. And there's your z-axis. Here is what the other drive options look like on the machine. So this was a prototype in a test bed, so we wanted it to uh, feature some other options. We were going to play around with some rack and pinion drives, so that's what you can see here. There are roller pinion drives, bearing assemblies. They are belt driven by the motor, and then there are these special uh, gear racks that get installed onto the hull. So there's some cutouts on the hull for that. So those are an option. You'll see those in the plate cuts. The machine still also supports the ball screw drives, so we're just going to kind of switch between the two. We'll start with the ball screw drives. Up here we have a belt drive displayed for the Z-axis. The Z-axis is exclusively screw driven, 
There are two options for Z-axis drive, which are direct drive or the belt reduction. And we did that to increase clearance a little bit and give the option to adjust sort of the travel speed of the Z-axis. We can gear it up or gear it down as needed. Every necessary hole should be incorporated into the design of this machine. So that's every hole for the rail systems. That's the holes for the ball screws. Everything down to wiring harness mounting locations, cable carrier mounting locations, controller mounting locations, power supplies, you name it. I've tried to integrate it all into the design. Ideally, we won't be drilling a single hole. In reality, I'm absolutely certain that that is not going to be the case. The spacings as far as offsets for the rail systems, for the ball screws, again, incorporated in the machine. If the fabrication goes well, and there weren't some modeling errors, uh, everything should line up quite nicely. I know that's asking a lot, but that's sort of what we're trying to do. Uh, I believe that uh, even if this is a little more challenging on the fabrication end, it will save time in the long run. Uh, the other machines I built, a lot of them were fabricated steel from structural steel components, and just seems to be an awful lot of work to get things to line up. There's a lot of manual drilling, there's a lot of shimming, there's just a lot of work involved with final assembly of the machine. Um, certainly as a percentage of the total build time, it's uh, what I would deem to be excessive, not sustainable if you're building machines regularly, which we are. I chose to build this machine out of steel, big, heavy, and sturdy. I'd like to be able to mill everything from wood products down to steel on this machine. So I just wanted something quite robust. And we'll see if I've just created a bunch more headaches or if this in concept works out and is something that I could pursue uh, for further machine development as we need them. So this is the surface I'm going to be using to do this. We kind of threw this together. We had a big piece of slate in a shop left over from a pool table. It got dismounted or dismantled. We've used it before. Uh, to make workbenches just as as just a basically a ballast, just a big heavy weight to make them a little more sturdy. So on this one, we're using it on top. Uh, and the reason for that is I needed a as flat as possible surface to work off of. And slate is actually a really good option. Pool slate is phenomenally flat. So as an alternative to buying a six or seven thousand dollar fab table that's been surface ground. This is sort of the, the poor man's way to do it. We're gonna probably just use the surface mostly for jigging and when we're welding, uh, I'll throw something on top just so it doesn't all get marred up. Like even just a little bit of, you can see where it's marking up the table, but it's a good size. It's, I don't know, five feet by maybe 42 inches or something like that. but. Big enough for this machine, all the parts, so I can just make sure everything's nice and flat as it's going together. So this is our straight edge. So this is a Veritas straight edge. It's accurate to three thousandths of an inch over its 50 inch length. You can see this is a milled surface. They're aluminum, they're really nice. That's, that's even a push, and that's a eight thousandths of an inch feeler gauge. That's pretty snug, it might even be a little bit under that. So that's pretty good. So that's snug. That's five thousandths of an inch. 